welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Good to be here. And explain to our audience where here is. Uh, we're in virtual land. So I'm in Phoenix, and I believe you're in, what, Manhattan Beach? I am, and I, they just reopened the beaches, and it feels like uh, July 4th. Although people are, people are respectfully distancing, but it feels like everything is open. I was talking to a friend who said, Old Town Scottsdale just looks like Daytona Beach right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> I was riding my bike through there yesterday, and yeah, uh, there's I had to be careful of the traffic. It, it went from being a ghost town to being crowded pretty quick. I think you run a higher risk of picking up all sorts of other uh, infectious diseases in Old Town Scottsdale rather than just uh, COVID. It's like it's, it's like a riskier either way. All right, let's let's talk about uh, investing, listeners. If you haven't yet. Go back and listen to Eric's podcast, one of the originals, one of the OGs on the Meb Faber show, probably four years ago. Uh, we had Eric on. It was a lot of fun. But um, how's 2020 looking for you? It's an interesting year. Normal? No, <laughs> anything but normal. It's a very, very interesting year. I had no idea what we were signing up for at the beginning of the year. Um, it's It's been a good experience for us. Um, you know, we're alternative investments focused. Um, but I, I don't know that I would wish this environment on my worst enemy for people that have, you know, stock heavy portfolios. So um, I can say this, you probably can't, but I looked up your uh, new funds and saw they were actually up on the year, which is a rarity in uh, this world. But uh, two big topics we're going to talk about today, all things trend following and managed futures. I uh, also want to hear about, you did a little sabbatical talking about uh, studying artificial intelligence, which we'll get to later. But let's start with trend following. You're one of my favorite um, students of history that has probably done uh, more research and simulations on all markets, not just stocks. But you also started a new firm. Tell us about the new firm. When uh, when did you guys get the ball rolling? Yeah, so we launched Standpoint Asset Management uh, late last year. Uh, it's a small firm. It's a new firm. Um, it's our baby, though. We love it. Um, we have a great crew of people, a small company of people that have aligned interests and a, you know, a shared value system. And we started the firm uh, to solve a problem in the marketplace. Uh, we recognize that there's a large group of people out there that realize that they need diversification beyond just stocks and bonds. But in our experience, they don't like, um, they don't, they don't want the experience of alternative investments. They don't like it. So the problem we're trying to solve is to meet that diversification need in a way that people actually want or can tolerate, you know, find the overlap between those two things. And that's what Standpoint's all about. Um, and it's been an interesting experience to get a firm up and running in this highly regulated new world that we live in. Uh, and then to be hit with COVID right out of the gate um, was you know, sort of a blessing in disguise because it demonstrated the benefit and the need for alternative investments. Uh, but like I said, I, I couldn't have predicted that. So so give us a little overview. Um, you know, you're a trend follower at heart or, or by inoculation, I don't know which, uh, or by logic, but uh, give us a broad overview as, you know, your views have shifted a little bit over the years on um, this new offering uh, there's almost a behavioral element to it. So maybe take us a step back, talk about sort of managed futures and trend following over the years and kind of what has led you to sort of your current belief system and iteration of uh, where we are in 2020. Sure. Well, let me first off start by admitting that I hated trend following <laughs> early in my career. I, I was actually an arbitrage guy coming out of our in college, um, the concept of trend following, the connotation of that phrase was uh, not appealing to me. It sounded juvenile. Uh, you're just hopping onto something and sticking with it for as long as it works. And then, you know, kind of the greater fool theory. But um, having been a student of data and finance and econometrics and computer science for 25 years now, you get to see um, history in different ways. You can reconstruct history in different ways and you can do a deep analysis on data. Uh, and it turns out that in my strong opinion, there's a very good reason why trend following works. 
and why it's sustainable and durable and why it produces um, diversification that you just don't see in other alternative asset classes. So you mentioned that my views have changed a little bit over the years. Um, that's true. Um, I've tried to improve. I've tried to, I've tried to take the knowledge that uh, I've acquired over time and convert that into wisdom. So, but I will say this: they haven't changed that much. The core belief that um, underpinned my previous company and the one before that was that trend-following managed futures is the best diversifier out there. And I think the empirical data really drives that point home. And I'll share some experiments that I've done with you. Uh, psychological experiments with people to to illustrate that. Um, my transition recently has been into um, accommodating investor desires. In other words, finding the overlap between what people want and what they need so that we can actually do business and I can get people to use enough managed futures to make a difference long term in a way that they're willing to tolerate. And I think that's the that's the big difference between what I'm doing now and what I've done over the previous 24 years. You know, the, the behavioral aspect that you mention is so important. And you, you actually have a quote in your standpoint deck uh, that I've never seen before, but I'm going to steal it. Um, and it's from uh, John Lentner. And I'll read the quote and then kind of let you talk about it. But it's on page four, and, and uh, we'll post this to the website, show notes if you let us. But let's talk about managed futures. And for the listeners who aren't familiar, uh, Lindner was one of the co-creators of CapM, right? And then all the way back in the 60s, um, which uh, is, is Nobel-worthy. Um, it says, the results are so compelling that the board of any institution, along with the portfolio manager, should be forced to articulate in writing their justification and not having a substantial allocation to the liquid alpha space of managed futures. That is quite a statement. You wanna you wanna dig in there? Yeah, it's a bold statement. Um, the most interesting thing about that is how little impact that statement actually had on the world. So here we are. I think he wrote that in the early 1980s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here we are in 2020, and that statement from a person with very high credibility uh, and all the data to back up his assertion had almost no impact on the world, which is interesting to me because I, I've seen it over and over. I mean, look, you know as much about managed futures as I do. You've been doing this for as long as I have. Um, you've seen the data. You know how much of a difference it makes. You know how many blind spot problems it solves in the portfolio. And yet, it's like pulling teeth to get people to use enough managed futures. Why is that? Why do you feel that is? Um, well, there's, and for the listeners uh, who aren't familiar, who are new to the Meb Faber Show, managed futures, uh, Eric could describe it better, but it's a long, short approach to all the world's markets. Um, but, uh, I think it's pretty simple and, you know, spending enough time in our world, you start to realize, you know, there's what Lintner talks about 50 years ago, there's the optimal portfolio and then there's the portfolio that people can handle and not just emotionally and psychologically, but career wise, if, if you're holding the purse strings. Um, and so finding that balance between what's optimal and not looking too different or not selling at the bottom of whatever, you know, equities, et cetera, folding that all together. And managed futures has like all the problems. First of all, it has a, it has the marketing problem of a name sounding scary. Futures, anything sounds scary. Uh, but at spice in those other things of looking different of, um, uh, being something that a lot of people just aren't familiar with. Those sound reasonable. What else? What else you got for us? Yeah, it's the lack of a narrative. Um, managed futures is um, the antidote to comfort for most people when they first um, experience it. So let me share with you my uh, somewhat unscientific experiment that I've been conducting for the past two and a half years, and I think this will drive the point home. So, and I've done this dozens of times, maybe over a hundred times now. I sit down with somebody, either a high net worth person or a financial advisor 
uh, or a friend, family member, and I'll, I'll show them a spreadsheet that contains the annual returns of the U.S. stock market going back to some year, 80, 70, something like that. And then next to those calendar returns, I will put the results of uh, a credible managed futures index. So they're looking at the 1980 return for the S&P and the 1980 return for, you know, one of the SOC Gen managed futures indexes. And then 81, 82, so on and so forth up to the current year. And then, so they can see that sometimes they move together, sometimes they move opposite, sometimes managed futures is down when the stock market is up. And I ask them, how would you feel about making a 5% allocation to this managed futures category? And they all do the exact same thing. They start going down the list until they find an instance where the stock market's up and managed futures is down. And then you see that look of, uh, on their face, uh, that's not good. And then they find a couple more of those. Um, and they're just, they're looking at the relative performance between the two. And they notice that managed futures is up sometimes when the stock market's down, but they really focus on the inverse of that. And so when I do this, nine out of 10 people tell me, I can't do that. I would mm. be out of, I would have, I'd be out of business in this year, this year, or maybe not out of business, but I would have two, three, 400 client calls. Uh, and that's enough to just kind of derail, uh, my business. So, and they're just being honest with me. And, and, and my estimate is that nine out of 10 people just would say, no, can't do it. I don't even need to go any further. Like that's, that's going to cause a problem. So then I say, no problem. I remove the managed futures and I replace it with something I call the mystery asset class, which between you and me is just a 50, 50 blend of stocks and managed futures rebalanced annually. Right. So I put this mystery asset class on there and I tell them, uh, let's repeat this, uh, but I'm not going to tell you what the asset class is until after you make your decision. So now they go through and they're looking at it and they do the same thing and they get to the bottom and they say, yeah, this, this is what I'm looking for. If this isn't something crazy, uh, I could see using this. It makes a lot of sense. And I ask them why. And they say, well, it's got nice up capture, uh, it's got reasonable down capture, and it doesn't fall too far behind. And I can see here that it's not highly correlated. Um, I could see myself using this. If it's not something crazy, uh, now they want to know what it is. But I still won't tell them. Now is where I get a little devious. And I ask them, all right, well, before uh, we were talking about a 5% allocation. What about 10? How would you feel about a 10% allocation to this? And they consider it, and they look at it again, they go through the exercise again, and their answer is almost always something similar to, if this isn't something crazy, yes, I could see myself putting 10% into this mystery asset class. Now tell me what it is. So when I reveal to them what it is, that it's just a 50-50 blend of stocks and managed futures, which you just rejected, uh, they're always flabbergasted, shocked. And then when I when I tell them that a 10% allocation to this is the same thing as a 5% allocation to the thing you rejected. So think about what's happened here. I went from a 90% failure rate and by blending them together, I have an 80% success rate. Opportunities like that don't come along very often in life where I've done nothing. Mathematically, it's the same thing. That is a 5% allocation to manage futures. It's just being delivered in a format that they both need and want at the same time. You have to satisfy both the needs and the wants. And the reason that this approach is so powerful, or at least convincing to me, is that I don't have to sell my soul to do this because that's how I invest. It's basically half stocks, half managed futures with a little bit of bonds sprinkled in. So I think it's a good way to invest. I think that's a great all-weather approach, and it meets the wants and the needs. So hopefully that drives home the point. Well, there's, there's a lot to dig into, um, you know, the first of which is you may have sent it to me or maybe somebody else um, sent me a piece from an investment bank and it was 90 percent sure is Goldman. But they did a study on managed futures and they were showing, all right, let's run the optimizations and how much should you include? And the results spit out some like like seventy percent of your allocation should be managed futures or something. So he said, "No, no, that's not realistic." Quote: We have to now constrain it because we all know 
you can't put 70% in managed futures. So they said, if you constrain it to, you know, less than 30% or whatever, then what's the optimal amount? <laughs> of course, the optimal amount was 30% because that was the maximum. It was just a funny, perfectly illustrates the mindset of like one of the smartest institutions on the planet that the math is somewhat, um, you can't argue it, but once you bring in all the uh, real world emotions and uh, psychological misgivings, it changes the uh, it changes the output. Well, that reminds me of another experiment that I did. Um, this I would I would use on more sophisticated people that really wanted to dig into the portfolio math. This one's more brief though. I would anonymize uh, four, four asset classes, stocks, uh, real estate, bonds, and managed futures. And I would show them these asset classes. Look, they'd be looking at the quarterly returns. And then down at the bottom of the spreadsheet, I would have the compounded annual return, the annualized standard deviation, the max drawdown, and then the average uh, covariance with the other asset classes. And I would tell them, all right, you're going to build an optimal portfolio for yourself. Uh, but we're going to make, we're going to force you to be objective and unbiased. I've anonymized the asset classes and I'm not going to show you the equity curves. All you have to work with are those, those metrics that I just gave you. So 100% of the time people choose managed futures first as the foundational asset class based upon those objective metrics. Uh, 100% of the time, now, as a small sample size, I probably did this with 30 people, but 100% of the time they choose managed futures because they had a, a good return lower vol, much lower drawdown, and the lowest correlation with the other asset classes. So they'd put 40% in managed futures. So the way I did it was 40, 30, 15, and then so on and so forth. Um, and then after they were done building their optimal portfolio, uh, I would strip away, um, I, would, I would reveal the asset classes and then ask them, how is this compared to your actual real life portfolio? And the answer was almost always the exact opposite of what I do in real life. So stuff, but here's the point, Meb, uh, you can do all this and you don't change people's behavior. They don't then go out and liquidate a bunch of stocks and real estate and reallocate to managed futures. Never, ever. So that's, that's the one thing I've learned that's crucially important is that it's not enough to be right. It's not enough to educate. You actually have to facilitate behavioral change. And that is, uh, that's a whole nother level. So, and that goes back to the, the original experiment is that if they're not willing to build or not able to build the optimal portfolio themselves, stop trying to cram the individual ingredients down their throat. There's something that you don't understand or they don't understand or that the real life just won't allow it to happen. But there's nothing stopping us from creating the optimal portfolio and delivering it to them. Maybe that's our job. Maybe we've just been missing the point for five decades. Yeah, you know, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit about um, the branding. Uh, we talk a lot about, obviously, dividends and buybacks. And, and buybacks just have such a bad stigma in brand, which are essentially, had they just been uh, labeled tax-efficient dividends, people <laughs> would have a totally different mindset than if you call them buybacks. It generates a different part of the brain. Same thing with managed futures. It just came up with a better Go back. You have to go back 40 years to do this, 50 years. But um, so that ship has sailed. So I like your idea of, um, you know, framing it or packaging it in a way that's more palatable um, because, I mean, you've spoken to hundreds, thousands of advisors over the years that and institutions that allocate. And I always love asking my managed futures buddies, I say, have you ever spoken to an institution that makes a significant, meaningful allocation to trend following, which I mean 25% plus, and there's very, very few, certainly none that really approach 50%. Do you know any that are even in that ballpark? Most people, I feel like they allocate maybe 5 or 10%. Is there, I, is there any anyone that really goes all in on the uh, trend following allocation? There's been a few in my experience, and it has killed them. Mm -hmm. Um, doing that has really put them in a bad position. Uh, but again, if, if they didn't have 40 or 50% in pure managed futures, you know, if, if they were in all weather products and those products were 40, 50% managed futures, their experience would have been radically different. Mm -hmm. 
because when people get their statement, they inevitably drill down and look at the top performers and the bottom performers and automatically assume that the bottom performers are doing something wrong. They hate the feeling of diversification. They don't like the dispersion. And it's just human nature. Uh, and no amount of education or bullying or yelling at them is going to change their psychological response to that phenomenon. But we have the power to smooth that out, to empower these people to embrace diversification. Um, it's like this. If you went to a restaurant and they brought out your meal ingredient by ingredient by ingredient and made you eat each one individually, how, how would your experience be? Atrocious. You know, you eat a fistful of onions and then you consume all the mustard and then you eat the burger patty, then you eat the bun. Nobody does it that way for good reason. So we're asset managers, we're portfolio managers. Maybe we've just missed the point. Maybe we're supposed to deliver something that people need and can tolerate. Yeah, I mean, and it also goes to the point of saying, um, by the way, this reminds me of my three-year-old who will not eat salmon, but he will eat salmon chicken. So the, mar the marketing and how it's presented <laughs> certainly means something. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's an accurate description. You know, one of the challenges that Managed Futures has, and it's, it's a feature, not a bug, is that it's very different looking. And, you know, um, the challenge of being very different looking is fantastic when it's different looking to the upside and, and um, a game changer career ender when it's different looking to the downside. You and I, four years ago, uh, chatted about a study I had read institutional that asked the institutions, these are trillion dollars of institutions, how long would you tolerate a manager underperforming uh, before firing them? And it was like 95% said less than three years or something. And I said, there's no way that's actually true because all those people should be fired. So I actually recreated that on Twitter and my Twitter followers, by definition, you know, I tweet about quant investing. So it's, it's, tends to be skewed towards more uh, professionals ask the same question, same answer, which is so horrifying, right? It was something like 85% was less than five years when in reality it should probably be almost a different and managed futures, you know, it, it has these periods in the last 10 years certainly have been one of those periods where I don't know, maybe what six out of the last 10 years, seven out of the last 10 years have underperformed on a yearly calendar basis. Does that sound that about right ballpark? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, and then it has the years like 2009, certainly 2020. Everyone's waking up. Um, tell me a little bit about how you guys actually construct, build your strategy. What does it look like? Are you trading hundreds of futures markets? Are you trend following on stocks? Are you doing value? How do you put it all together? How do you take the onions and the uh, ingredients and, and put them into a, the big... Uh, uh, final entree. Sure. Good topic. So earlier in this conversation, you mentioned my sabbatical. I, I did take uh, a little over a year off about a year and a half. And I decided to, um, just take stock of everything I've learned, uh, try to try to convert that knowledge into wisdom, talk to my mentors, um, talk to my peers in the industry. Um, I did study artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, genetic algorithms for the second time. I studied that stuff back in the 90s when when those names weren't cool. Um, and I just decided to build the best managed futures program that I could build. And that was a very interesting experience. I, I learned a lot about myself um, and about the industry because you approach it with um, much more knowledge, much more experience and a clean slate and a fresh, fresh perspective. Um, and I won't go into the details of every single thing I learned, um, but uh, there is an interesting point to all this. I built a really, really complicated, uh, elegant approach that I thought, wow, this is the uh, this is the Lexus of managed futures programs, and it's harnessing all the interesting uh, things I've learned over the years. And then I built a um, a benchmark for it, which is just a simple, plain vanilla, old school, just get the blocking and tackling right, really durable, just three moving parts, um, CTA program. And then when I looked at the difference between the two, it was so minuscule. It was so tiny. 
that I couldn't justify the potential fragility and model risk uh, of the Lexus version. So I made the decision to go with the Jeep, 1948 Jeep version, because the thing has just done exactly what you wanted it to do for 50 years. It just keeps on collecting that risk transfer premium in the futures markets and does it in a risk controlled manner. Um, it's lumpy, but that's what you want from something. If you want to be able to trust a managed futures program, it better be pretty lumpy. Otherwise, it's probably got too many moving parts and eventually it's going to stumble onto a market environment that it can't handle. So that was humbling uh, to take this thing that took me a year to build and then compare it to the the relatively simple, durable benchmark. But then when I talked to my mentors like Tom Basso, uh, who's the chairman of our board, um, and other people in the industry, um, they all basically said the same thing. You know, eventually you get to the point where you just got to put your ego aside and realize that um, these CTAs, they're all collecting the same risk premia. Uh, the only real alphas don't charge the same fees uh, and don't blow up, meaning take risk seriously, uh, be humble, be pragmatic, uh, and stay disciplined. So in the end, you know, I that's what we're doing. And I'm excited about that. I really enjoy winning by not losing. I enjoy playing defense. I enjoy um, trying to win a marathon rather than winning sprints. Well, we, we often say on Twitter and on the podcast, the, the whole key to uh, the investment business and entrepreneurship and anything is just surviving. So it's true in, in the investment world, too. Um, I'm glad to use the analogy of 40s Jeep instead of 1960s Land Cruiser because my Land Cruiser basically spent all the time in the shop, and I would have said that's a terrible, <laughs> terrible analogy. <laughs> Redo that uh, one. But I've had to sell. I had to sell it anyway because the seats go sideways in the back, and I don't think you can put a, a child seat in there. Um, okay, so uh, you've been a craftsman as far as it comes to actually putting the portfolio together, and I love the sort of. Um, you know, take away of the simplicity, but for many people still, what you're doing is not that simple. What does the portfolio, you know, how does it actually, you obviously don't have to give the specific algorithms, but how does it look, what markets are you trading? Uh, you know, are you targeting a certain level of vol? How do you kind of put it all together? Give me the, the, uh, Thomas Keller chef's summary of what the, uh, what the product looks like. So we're trading the 75 most liquid futures markets in the world that are legally accessible um, by U.S. citizens. So it's going to be a who's who of markets that you know. Probably the least liquid, most obscure market that we're trading would be feeder cattle. Um, and we're trading some markets that other people might not trade, like carbon emission credits in in, uh, in France, but they're deeply liquid, and those European CTAs are trading them. So, you know, it's it's the two-year treasury, 5, 10, 20. It's crude oil, Brent crude, natural gas, um, gold, silver, corn, wheat. It's all the global futures markets that you know and love. Um, and I have a process for adding new markets and eliminating old markets because everything we do is liquidity weighted. So we're essentially um, aligning our participation to the open interest in those markets. So if you think of the S&P 500 or the Russell 1000 as a market cap weighted index, our futures program is an open interest weighted participation in all the different futures markets, which sounds a little radical at first glance. But when you look at the big CTAs, you know, the guys over in London and whatnot, um, they have to trade this way. There's no other way for them to put 40 or $20 billion to work. So, um, and this was eye opening for me as well. Uh, cause in the past, you know, I, I tried to put an emphasis on including less liquid markets like Malaysian palm oil, um, Japanese kerosene, um, you know, obscure markets and in a simulation, they make a difference. But if you're managing a meaningful amount of money, you simply can't participate in those markets. So I wanted an intellectually honest representation of what history would have looked like for a program like this. And the only way to do that accurately uh, is to open interest weight your positions. And then when I did it, I was actually very pleasantly surprised at how effective that has been for the past 40 years. So I think that answers your question about what markets. Mm -hmm. um, how are we doing it? This is an important concept. So I talked earlier about keeping it simple and just doing the same thing that's worked for the past 40, 50 years. 
there is a risk uh, when you pick an individual manager. Um, there's a lot of dispersion between the annual results of different trend following firms. You know, some are up 20% year to date this year. Some are down 12. I don't like well that. Well aware. I owned one of the ones that was down 12, but we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, some of the guys that are down 12 are just sticking to their knitting. Um, yeah. and they could, they could be up 30, um, when the industry's flat, you know, it, it cuts both ways, but I'm not a fan of that kind of dispersion. I want the returns of managed futures as a whole. So, but I am a single manager. So how do I deal with that? Well, I went with three different models. I went with a short-term model, a medium-term model, and a long-term model. And they zig and zag, and there's, there's some dispersion between them. But if you look at the net blended result, um, you get something that's very consistent with the industry at large. So that's what I can do to minimize this quote-unquote single manager risk, which I think is important. If I'm telling people you need to use enough managed futures to make a difference, that's hard for you to do because of all the stuff we talked about earlier. So I'm going to do it for you and roll it into one product. Well, I don't want to subject them to excess individual single manager risk. So also I'll say for the record that, um, in the end, the decisions that we made at the end, um, were there needed to be overlap between the, the stuff that we're offering to other people has to be what we do with our own money. We got to find the overlap between, I would be willing to invest in this for 30 years. Um, and it has to be something that's appealing to other people. That was the mandate. So uh, we do eat our own cooking in that sense. So it's just for kind of um, illustration, we're at mid, late May, uh, to the extent you can. What, what are some of the markets that would be long right now? Some of the ones that may be short, just as sort of a snapshot on what the world looks like here at the, uh, at the end of May? Sure. So the style of trend following that I'm looking at, um, you know, obviously your short energy have been short and that's been an epic trade, uh, so far this year. And I mean, do you remember back, back in the day when there were some trend following indexes, they were like, no, 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 we'll, we'll go long short except for energy. We won't short, <laughs> we won't short energy. And this is when they published the index but back when, you know, oil was at like 130 or something. And it was like the most, classic example of of just back fit optimizing why in the world you wouldn't short energy because it would hurt the back test but here here we are fast forward 10 years later and futures contracts traded at negative um anyway i that was a fun remembrance it, it it's baffling um i've had that argument ad nauseum for years with people even recently as recently as december and january about you know crude oils all the way down to 50 a barrel how much lower can it go i can't short this thing here from seasoned veterans in the industry. Um, and I, you know, I respect their opinion. They've got rules and you know, that's, that's their system. But I look at it and say, you know, you don't make money on the short side from, from outright directional price moves. You make it from the roll yield off the contango typically, um, at least over the long term. And the implied and explain to the listeners what that means, by the way, if they're not familiar with. Sure. So, um, you could short crude oil at, where's it at right now? 30 a barrel. Um, you could short the August crude oil at, would you say 36? I don't know. Just whatever. Let's use 30. Okay. Yeah. Let's say it's at 30. Shorted at 30 a barrel, uh, and then roll from August to September and then September to October, so on and so forth. It can finish the year at 30 a barrel and you could have made a 40% return because every time you rolled out of a contract, you were rolling into something that was trading at a premium. And that premium exists in the in the futures world because expectations, interest rates, and storage costs get baked into the futures curve. So trend followers need to understand this because half their returns come from the roll yield component. Now, contango is a downward pressure yield, and then backwardation is an upward pressure yield. So um, it's kind of like dividends. You know, if you're looking at a stock and you know you bought it at 50, it finished the year at 50, and then you look at your statement and you say, "Why am I up six percent? It finished where it started." Well, you got four dividends along the way. You have to factor in the total return. Roll yield in futures is kind of like a dividend, except that it can be positive or negative depending upon the term structure and what's going on in the world. 
So in the energy world right now, there's an enormous negative dividend in the form of skyrocketing storage costs that's being priced into the futures curve. If you're a short seller, you're essentially a synthetic storage provider right now. And you could make a lot of money being short, even if the price of crude oil doesn't go down. So it sounds complicated, but once you look at a chart and think it through, it's like, oh, I see how it works. What was the uh, experience like for you? And to my knowledge, there, I assume there has been at some point, I think I asked this question and, and somebody mentioned that it happened to natural gas once before. Had you ever seen negative trading futures markets um, in any commodity or anything uh, before? Not in real time. When you back adjust contracts, you see negative prices all the time, but that's not what people are talking about. Um, some electricity forwards uh, go negative at times. Um, I do think there was an obscure natural gas contract. I think it was over in the UK that went negative once a long time ago. But beyond that, no. Uh, this has really uh, caused problems for a lot of people having prices go negative. And, uh, you know, it's a dangerous thing to talk about. Well, it's easy to talk about it now, but I was on a podcast a few months ago and someone asked me about, you know, could crude oil go negative? And I said, well, theoretically it could if the storage costs exceed the salvage value of the toxic substance in there. And I got all kinds of phone calls from people yelling at me saying that's absurd. Prices can't go negative. <laughs> um, so anyways, it's one of those things where you learn after the fact. Well, the uh, I think it costs was it interactive brokers like a hundred million dollars uh, for trading errors because they they couldn't uh, they couldn't deal with the the you know it just went to zero and that was it they couldn't deal with the the software um, anyway all right so your short energy um, what else I assume fresh gold is probably along at this point yeah so. Um... Some of the precious metals are in uptrends. Some of the bonds are technically in uptrends. Um, most of the grains and softs are in downtrends. So CTAs are generally going to have short positions in things like cotton and corn. Uh, wheat's a little different, uh, but canola, soybeans, bean oil. Um, there's a lot of deflation out there. Uh, the meats, uh, lean hogs, live cattle, those are generally short right now. Um so it's mostly a short exposure. Um, the only long exposure that that really jumps out at me are bonds, a little bit of dollar long position. So it's an unusual uh, posture for CTAs, but it's it's uh, not unbelievable given the current market circumstances. Well, the thing about bonds is interesting too, because you know certainly when you and I were going to university, they weren't talking that much about sovereigns trading at negative interest rates. Right. Um, the modern reality of plenty of the world trading at negative interest rates at this point um, is sort of <laughs> sort of a new phenomenon. But it's interesting because as you think about managed futures in general, too, uh, at least I'm just kind of spitballing here. And you think of the potential outcomes of the world and what the future may look like of inflation which is one that a lot of people say, look, managed futures is great because you'll end up owning commodities and be long these in a traditional portfolio dump. But, but deflation scenario is also a potential, um, you know, benefit with managed futures positioning too. Uh, you know, I, I think I saw someone talking about on Twitter the other day where the, the Fed futures for end of the year was saying negative interest rates. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts there. I'm just kind of... Uh, I have too many thoughts about that. <laughs> I, uh, my third and final experiment that I'll tell you about, um, th this is a newer experiment, obviously, but I, I try to, I try to explain the opportunity to invest in bonds to people without identifying that I'm talking about bonds. So I just describe the attributes of this investment and I say, look, you know, here's an asset class. Uh, it's got a lot of history. Uh, ninety nine percent of your of your return comes from the yield component. Uh, there are some capital gains or losses from time to time, but those net out to basically zero over time. Um, the current uh, yield is about sixty five basis points. Um, and how do you and, and the fees are really low. How do you feel about uh, oh, and it's negatively correlated with stocks most of the time. Um, recently it wasn't in the past, you know, so about, about 30% of the time it's negatively correlated with stocks of the past hundred years, but recently it's been negatively correlated. Uh, how do you feel about investing in this? 
you know, and there are people ask me, they're like, well, isn't that below the rate of inflation? I say, yeah, it's, it's below the rate of inflation. They say 65 basis. So that's my expected return going forward. And I said, well, it could be a little more, a little less, but generally speaking, yeah, the, whatever the yield is, is about 90% accurate at predicting your future compounded return. And they shake their head and they're like, well, why would I ever invest in such a thing? And then they say, oh, wait a minute, but if the yield goes up, though, then we'll get a higher yield. And I said, no, you're locked in, you know, and you're going to take a capital loss if the yield goes up. Um, and that's not strictly true, but it is for the purposes of this uh, explanation. So basically, 10 people out of 10 say, that's absurd. I would never invest in such a thing. And then yeah. I revealed to them, I'm talking about the 10-year treasury. <laughs> so wait, I have 40% of my portfolio in that. What do you mean? <laughs> um yeah, you know the the long held beliefs are, are hard to uh, hard to really change. Um, how do you guys handle the stock component? Do you just index it? You just do market cap weighting? Do you do some other uh, approach? What do you guys do? Yeah, so you know from our our conversations over the last ten twelve years that I I did a lot of strategies on individual common stocks and sector indices and whatnot, trend following in nature vol trading, um, stuff like that. And I looked at that. I, I, I did my best to come up with uh, well thought out, constructed trend following approaches on equities. But I wanted to look at everything on an after tax, after inflation, after uh, transaction cost, operational costs basis. Uh, and knowing what I know about managing money inside of a 40 act mutual fund structure, there's some other considerations that you have to be aware of. And when I, this was actually very surprising to me. I built some really nice sector rotation and trend following on, on sectors programs that on a standalone basis, they look great. I'd be very comfortable investing in these, not the most tax efficient, but re reasonable tax efficiency, um, and really good risk adjusted returns. Th that was my opinion of the research that I was looking at. But then when I blended it with managed futures and I'm like, Oh, that, that looks good. It looks good. And then I said, all right, again, let's look at the baseline benchmark, which is uh, market cap weighted indexes, which we know are ridiculously tax efficient, where the fees are almost zero. Uh, I think you can get most of these things for three or four basis points. Um, the Bank of New York, there's there's a handful now that are straight up zero. Bank of New York has some. Um, who is it? SoFi launched some that were zero. One's negative at this point with the yeah. waiver, but obviously that's not sustainable. <laughs> But, well, effectively, uh, most, zero. Yeah, well, effectively, most of them are negative at this point. If you factor yeah. in the short interest credit they're collecting and putting back into the fund, which is why they're outperforming their benchmarks. So, so I compared um, my tactical rotational trend following on global equities to um, these kind of buy and hold fee efficient, tax efficient market cap weighted indexes. And I really liked the tactical ones better on a standalone basis, but something very interesting happens when you blend it in with managed futures. The plain boring beta version blends in nicer with managed futures, which was well humbling. Uh, but at the end of the day, I've got to do what, again, the overlap between what, what people want, people need and what's intellectually honest. Um, but I needed to dig in and say, well, why? Why does uh, this thing that has 50% drawdowns uh, every 20 years and 15% vol, why does it blend better in with managed futures? Well, it's because in the managed futures program, you're trading those same indexes. And when you, um, when you get short signals with your various trend following systems in the managed futures program, it acts like a hedge. The problem with the rotational trend following on equities component is you're double hedging if you also if you combine that with the managed futures program. So in other words, the managed futures program and the tactical equity stuff, they share the same blind spot. And that's what happens after during the recovery. They share the same blind spot. So they looked good when combined, but combining managed futures with just market cap weighted indexes looked better. And you still have the hedging kind of risk mitigation strategy. It's just over in the managed futures program. So that's why we, that's what we do. Yeah. You know, we, we often will describe to people market cap weighting as, I mean, it trend following at its very core. It's one of the simplest and oldest trend following systems out there. Uh, but the, um, um, 
idea that I believe you wrote about and proposed way back when with your capitalism distribution paper, which, and you can correct me on this, I, it may or may not be true. Uh, you can tell me about the paper, which is, I've seen like six academic and investment bank papers after yours came out. And I still don't think anyone has given you attribution for being one of the first people to write about this. <laughs> Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you were the first person I had seen that had done work on this. Is that accurate? You guys want to tell the listeners what we're talking about? Sure. Yeah, you put me on the spot. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed doing that research. The, those papers are still floating around out there. One's called Does Trend Falling Work on Stocks? And another one's called The Capitalism Distribution. Um, I don't own the rights to those papers, but I, the research is good. Uh, and it basically showed that the vast majority of the stock market's gains came from a very small minority of stocks. Very small. It was kind of a 80-20, where 80% 80 of the gains came from 20% of the stocks. It's actually more like 90-10. Uh, and that was consistent uh, across different countries, Canada, UK, Japan, US. Uh, it, and we, so we called it the capitalism distribution, where uh, a small group of really large winners drive the performance, and most stocks are actually below average. So from that, um, we developed kind of a thesis that maybe you could figure out a way to concentrate in these stocks that are going to be the big winners going forward. And maybe the best way to do that is with a trend-following approach using some sort of a stop loss to kind of cull the herd and get rid of the below average stocks. And I believe that does work. I believe it has worked. I believe it'll work in the future. Uh, the degree to which it works needs to be pretty high to offset the subsequent taxes, transaction costs and whatnot. But I think there's, there's enough room there. Um, my point though, is that I'm a chef, I'm blending ingredients. Uh, asparagus may be better than parsley, but not for this particular meal. So market cap weighted indexes, which you accurately pointed out, are really just kind of slow moving trend following systems in and of themselves without a lot of risk management. They blend better with managed futures from my perspective than these standalone superior tactical strategies. So that's why we do it. You know who has been arguably one of the best framing and marketers of trend following is uh the private equity space uh, specifically venture capital you know which is essentially very similar to uh equity public market investing market cap weighting uh but on a much 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 smaller market cap basis where they're investing in companies around 10 million 20 million market cap or less and uh, and then essentially it's a trend following approach where if you do 100 investments and one or two of those goes 100x, 500x, uh, essentially their, their stop loss is zero <laughs> where they just assume. Uh, but it's the same return distribution, which is that massive power law that you're talking about. But the reason they've done such a good job and have been able to raise so much money um, is two things that managed futures doesn't have. One a 10 year lockup, meaning you're not going to find out the returns of this portfolio for 10 years. And, um, and second, you can't sell the holdings even if you wanted to, because they're, uh, you know, not accurately, uh, at least for the most part, you don't even know in many cases, mark to market. And so the venture capitalists and angel investors have figured this out. And if you could just blind manage futures, that's a better idea of, of maybe to, to think about ways to talk about this. Say, look, on a 10 year basis, um, you know, but but that's an area where they've raised and they continue to raise so much money uh, and rightfully so. But again, a very much long volatility power law distribution. It's interesting. I often talk to all my friends and venture capital and angel and there's very little crossover with guys that actually do trend following in public markets too i don't know that many maybe you know some um i actually don't know any if i can think about it accurately um anyway just a random random aside all right so enough of med rant you put half together stocks market cap weighted do you use etfs do you do direct what do you do so we chose to go with ETFs. Um, <clears throat> I spent a lot, I probably spent six months studying the microstructure of these different ETF markets. And there were no surprises. It was the big brand names, the Vanguards, the Schwabs, the State Streets and BlackRock. Those guys do such an amazing job under the hood of um, 
negotiating the custody fees and the foreign taxes and then lending the shares out to short sellers and collecting the short interest credit and rebating it back to the fund. Uh, and then they charge you three basis points for that whole thing. So if I was going to replicate what they're doing myself, which I could do, uh, I estimated that it would cost me about 18 basis points. Uh, so why don't I just pay them the three and call it a day? Um, they're really good at what they do, and the fees are just almost zero. So we looked at using index futures, um, but it's much more tax efficient if you can buy and hold those ETFs. You just don't sell them. Relegate all your active tactical stuff into the managed futures program, the hedging and whatnot, because it is all pooled into one vehicle. So you get the benefit. So the idea here was to minimize taxes as much as possible. So, and the best way to do that is hold your equities as cash equities. Don't use leverage. Don't be tactical. Don't sell them. Keep all that stuff relegated over to the managed future side. Minimize taxes over there as much as possible through product structuring. Uh, and then you'll get a reasonable tax rate at the fund level. That's the idea behind it. And you guys have two of the better tickers for the mutual funds. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can, I'll say them. I won't spell them out. So I think we'll pass compliance with Blender and Remix. But um, Julian Robertson famously said when a young hedge fund manager said, I need some advice. He said, what do you recommend? I'm starting up launching this new fund complex. And he had said, just be lucky. Have a great start. Uh, so you guys <laughs> launched December 31st uh, of last year. Can you walk me through maybe sort of a real-time diary, blow-by-blow blow of what the first three to five months of this year were like, uh, you know, as someone who, who just launched a new fund? How did the systems perform? What were the conversations with advisors? How are they reacting? How do they continue to react? It happened so fast, you know, in, in equity markets. I think it was the fastest ever from all-time high to bear market. Um, in U.S. stocks, and you can correct me if you have a different perspective. But how's uh, how's 2020 been? Start of a new decade. Well, like we were talking about earlier, it's been very, very interesting. I did not predict this. I didn't know, um, and I can't talk too much about the fund or performance you or can anything. Talk about the strategy, however. Yeah. Uh, this so the strategy was well prepared, and. Um, You'll hear me use the word preparedness 50 times a day. Um, that that's, that's what's important to me, is just not being caught off guard and just being as prepared as you possibly can. So I'm very gratified um, by the resiliency of the strategy in what you described accurately. That was the fastest 30% decline in the history of the U.S. stock market. Um, and it's really caught a lot of people off guard. And a lot of the alternative investments out there have been exposed, again, uh, for offering almost no diversification benefit when you need it the most. And I think Managed Futures has done a, you know, an okay job this year of demonstrating that, you know, Managed Futures, and it's a short list of alts that actually stand up and deliver when you need them. Most of them just crumble uh, when you need them the most. So, yeah, I would say that the short energy trade and the long bond trade really paid off for trend followers that went with those trades this year. Those that didn't go with those trades, they may have had good reasons. That was part of their strategy, uh, but they, they've they suffered um, some consequences from that this year. So yeah, I would say I'm very happy and pleased, um, uh, but not surprised. You know, That's why I built it this way. Yeah. And I'm not trying to make a lot of money when the stock market goes down. I'm not a bear market guy. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a perma bear. I just want that, that really truly diversified all weather approach, uh, that we can stick with, that people can stick with. That's going to compound into the future, um, and help us, you know, finish the marathon. Two questions. One quick one. Um, are you guys in your stock allocation? Is it us only or is it global? It's global. Uh, right now, it's about 60% U.S., 20% Europe, 20% uh, developed Asia. And no emerging, no China. Um, I just want the global equity market risk premium from developed countries. So um, this is a personal question. As a rules-based algorithmic guy, uh, one of the biggest surprises I saw this year was a lot of what you saw as these, quote, passive indexes um, for the supplies to all 
slices of quants, you know, whether you call yourself active or passive or whatever, um, a lot of these uh, indices and firm companies said, hold on, we're not going to rebounce or we're going to change the rules just kind of on the fly. It's seemingly a, a fairly discretionary decision and it caused some ripple effects. At one point, I think it was uh, not Janice and Vesco that had to pay their fund a hundred million dollars. Did you see this? No. Because no. They, yeah, they had to pay a hundred million dollars because uh, either they forgot to rebalance or the company <laughs> forgot to, the index didn't rebalance and they did something happened, but it was clearly out of prospectus. Anyway, talk to us a little bit about when would you ever consider uh, you know, adding discretion or are you fully on board with it? And is there instances at which you would turn the dials, maybe uh, covering your energy shorts at minus 50 or something? What, when, when, is, how, when and how does that play have any influence on what you guys do? That's a great question. Um, oh, for the record, I don't trust people that say um, we never, ever use discretion. Um, we're 100% systematic and automated and will never intervene. I do this for a living and I have for a long time. That's just not possible. Um, you have a board of directors, you have the SEC, you have people changing the rules. Um, and these are, these are interpreted rules. There's gray areas. Um, you have to be willing to take action. I had to take action already this year, uh, where I had to get out of the front month crude oil contract because it was, uh, turning negative. And, you know, I've got, people on the phone. Um, I've got powerful compliance people calling me, uh, from multiple different firms saying, uh, we need everyone to get out of this, this contract. So, um, who could have foreseen that? And if they call up and they get your automated system on the phone with them, you know, giving them ones and zeros, how do you think that's going to go over? So, and then I saw what happened I and mean, I talked to people in the industry, everyone had to get out of the contract because it was down 300% in one day. It was up 124, 144% the next day. Stuff like that comes along. Um, so, and there are circumstances. So here's my philosophy on that. I built an automated process to help me. I use algorithms as tools, like you would use a shovel or a pick or an ax or something like that. Um, they're there to minimize uh, grief. They're there to maximize efficiency and um, uh, make things accurate. But you can't. You just can't rely on the computers across the board. So, um, and my philosophy is: if the system collectively that I built isn't doing what I designed it to do, I'll intervene. Now. It could be that there's an error in your system and that's bad and you need to fix that and go back to the drawing board. But more often, it's the environment has changed. Crude oil went negative. They changed the rules. The SEC said you can't, you know, there's too much notional value in the two-year treasury. Uh, it's not the system's fault. You built it with one set of rules. The rules changed on you. Now you got to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, given what I know now, how would I do this? So for, from that perspective, yes, I have to always stand ready to intervene with some discretion. In my experience, about once every two years, um, something comes up that you need to go in and use your judgment, um, make some changes and move on. And so your strategy in general, 50% stocks in the futures, do you have, uh, some collateral sitting in bonds or anything else too, or is it just stocks, futures contracts and sitting in short term cash or something? So, um, I did have some bonds earlier in the year, but when the interest rates plummeted, uh, to where they're at now, there's just no, there's no reason to deviate from, from cash. So I own some treasury based ETFs for collateral purposes, but most of it is, cash there's just no there's no yield right now it's not worth it you know why take any there, yeah. it's is uh i think last time we just we chatted there's no the crypto market wasn't uh liquid as a futures market is that still the case or is that something you guys include it's still the case so i look at it every day i i've got a lot of friends that are crypto enthusiasts develop python developers uh, javascript developers and they they swear up and down every day that you know tokenization and crypto and all this stuff and so I, I i keep up with it and i watch it and the open interest in uh, bitcoin futures has been climbing 
but it's still very small. Uh, it's not meaningful enough to include in the program. I'm not going to rule it out, though. I actually do think that three to six years from now, crypto assets, um, once they get over some regulatory hurdles, and you can get some feeling for what the intrinsic value is of these things, I think that you need to be open-minded about participating in them. And that's going to be a challenge for some people from a regulatory perspective. So as, as you've uh, been in the trenches for the first five months of the year, what are the con conversations as you're talking to advisors about <clears throat> you alls strategy? Um, a, what have they been saying? What's the reaction been? What are their concerns? What are their um, complaints so far this year? And then also, how are you positioning it? So is it something you say, look, this is a, I mean, I, I know conceptually it could be 100% of a portfolio, but I'm guessing most advisors don't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> how, how do they sort of like, what's the conversation been like and what are they, what are they doing? Well, truthfully, there haven't been that many conversations. And I think that, um, I think it's because they're having a lot of conversations with other managers in their portfolio. Um, this COVID thing has people working from home, um, the advisors I know and do business with have been on the phone. Their, their client calls are 10 times higher than normal. Um, so the feedback I've gotten is that you're not the problem in our portfolio. So we just don't need to talk to you right now. And I just can't do one more phone call. So, um, this, this damn small cap value guys, I think they printed down half this year at one point. Yeah, and I see that debate out there in the space um, between uh, what's the AQR guy and, and uh, someone else. And the, it's interesting to see this all playing out in, in real time. Um, but you also asked the question, how do we position it going forward? Um, you know, I have, I just say what I say. I have conversations just like this with people. And I just tell them why we did it, what problem we think it's going to solve, and, and how we, this is what we do with our own money. Uh, and then ask them, how would you position it? And the answer we usually get back from them as, well, it's a, it's a clever way to get alternatives, uh, with, but it gets rid of 80% of the cognitive and psychological problems that alternatives create. So we can see uh, the value from that. Um, it's also clever in the sense that um, it's got enough of the upside capture that you're not going to get left too far behind if the market... I'm just sharing with you their opinion. Um, you're not going to get left so far behind that clients are going to be screaming for this thing to be removed from the portfolio. But also there's enough um, long vol managed futures in there to make a difference if we go into you know seriously hostile market conditions. Um, and they say just just frame it as an all weather strategy. They basically come back to my argument that this is your all weather multi-asset uh, global portfolio. And it's, you know, the idea is um, every it's, it's not stocks, it's not bonds. It's, it's everything else that you need and just stick it in the alt sleeve. If you want to um, preferably have like a, uh, an all weather or a multi-asset sleeve. I think alts have a bad name at this point. And see if it ever gives you a reason to want to kick it out. And that's our plan, is to get in there, get a 2 3% allocation, uh, have people experience it and say, you know what, I don't hate this thing, um, and just grow. Because eventually they're going to find something in their portfolio they don't like, and you can gather assets that way and just get our, 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 our spot in the portfolio and grow that over time. And I, I, that's my thesis anyways. We'll see if I'm right. There's got, there's got to be a lot of that that's going to get the boot after the first uh, quarter or two of the year. Um, you got a curious mind. I know you can't help yourself. What else is on your brain as you look out to the horizon for the next decade? Any studies you're working on? Any things that got you curious uh, other, than, uh, other than growing the fund and the firm? What, it, what, what's, what's burning on your brain? You know, the, the biggest difference between me today and me in the past is I spend less time agonizing over the markets um, and why they do what they do and more time on empowering investors and advisors to not be their own worst enemy when it comes to alternative investments. So that's really what's on my brain. Uh, and I shared some of those uh, unscientific experiments with you earlier. Uh, and there's another one that I th that's I, th I think you'll really like this one. It's it's extremely revealing. I I ask people what they want. Uh, they describe it to me, and they always describe something that's got alpha over the market. 
It never underperforms. It's got really low fees. Um, you know, they're always describing this kind of Superman fund that kind of like the Bill Miller fund for 15 years where it just always outperformed. Uh, but it, the drawdown has to be less than the market. The vol has to can't be more. The the return needs to be higher, and 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 the fees need to be low. So I, I went out and I created that hypothetically. You know, I just took the market's returns and I increased them such that it had this this um, I call it the perfect alpha fund had a 200 basis points of pure alpha every year, and it never underperforms. Not one quarter, not one month, not one week, not one day. Um, and then you go back to the original experiment let them blend that in uh, and compare it to managed futures um, without telling them that it's the perfect alpha fund. And it never gets a high weighting because it offers no diversification benefit. So this thing that everyone says they want, if you get them to actually build a portfolio without biases in an objective manner, they never give it a high weighting. So there's this disconnect between what people want and what they need. So doing stuff like this, that's how I spend my time. It's interesting, and I think it's empowering. Um, but again, you can't just show people that they're wrong. That doesn't help anyone. You actually have to give them a solution if they want to accept it. So this, this, this is a great lead gen tool idea. Like, how do you not just build this into a website and uh, call it the, the Crittenden's Paradox? And you have to go through this quiz and it spits out the, you know, what they are at the end. That be that would be a hugely revealing exercise, I would think, or at least do it as a uh, you want to do it. You want to come do it on, a, on the show. We can do it as a webinar or a demonstration. Um, but that's powerful because I think that really demonstrates to people these behavioral biases and, and beliefs they have, you know, that's, that's a pretty powerful demonstration. Well, here's a, here's another even more powerful way to, to kind of demonstrate to people how biased they are. Um, you just give them an all weather portfolio, just give it to them and say, this is what you've got. And your job is to run this endowment or this family, uh, office for the next 20 years. Uh, Oh, wait, I forgot. I need to take um, asset class E out of there. I want to remove managed features because I don't think you're going to like it. And when you remove it, they get to see the delta. They get to see what happens to the portfolio when you remove it. Uh, so you you remove it, and now you're taking something away from them, and they can see the degradation. They can see that the returns went down, the vol went up, and the drawdown doubled or whatever. Um, and then if you have that tied to a retirement planning software that's showing you like the Monte Carlo simulation and the percent of surviving portfolios, they can see all that degradation too. Um, good luck with that. People don't like it when you take stuff away from them. So it's hard to get them to adopt stuff. But if you just give them the final result and then try to take managed features away from them, all of a sudden their psychology shifts and they're, they're owning that decision to keep it. So there's all these weird um, cognitive psychology is the most interesting field in the world. And I think people use it incorrectly. We, they go around beating people over the head and saying, see, this is how you're wrong. This is how you're wrong. See this mistake you're making? Just invert the whole thing. Use it for good. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, there's, we got a whole list of studies. Academics, if you're, if you're out there looking for some research material, I mean, the old one of favorites, which I want to run, is you take the newspaper headlines throughout the last 120 years, and it can't be market related. It can't obviously be like the market goes down 20% today, but literally like, you know, Pearl Harbor, whatever, the, the biggest headlines the last 100 years, and then say, can you correctly predict what the stock market is over the next week or the next month or the next year? And we know what the outcome would be. It would probably be pretty random um, for the most part. But uh, a lot of these ideas, um, you start to see some of the behavioral nudges and hacks that get people into... Um, behaving well like uh famously i think the target date funds you know mm -hmm. are, are ones where people they at least view them as a somewhat different bucket rather than their like investing market bucket i don't know why uh but but they do and tend to behave a little bit better i don't know it's something i struggle <laughs> a lot with obviously uh it's hard it's hard it's hard to uh it's hard to figure out so i've got these notes in front of me um and one of the words on there is action. You know, I've got independence, discipline, humility, preparedness, wisdom, uh, but I've got action on there. And that, that's been a, an eye-opening thing for me and, and humbling in the sense that, you know, I used to think it was enough to just show people evidence and, and 
point s- stuff out and then expect them to go make changes on their own. Uh, and I've been historically disappointed in the results of that, but it's my own fault. Uh, you got to take it one step further and help them take action. But it means correctly diagnosing what the real issue is. So was it a lack of knowledge? Um, that was part of it. But it's, it's a lack of an actionable plan, something to do. So I'm, I'm with standpoint, the whole point is to rectify that and see if did we actually do it? Did we do we meet an unmet need in the marketplace? Uh, that overlap between what people want, what they need. And we'll we're going to prove ourselves right, hopefully. Uh, but we'll see. What uh, we got five minutes, three minutes. You got any uh, any any final ideas, thoughts, any uh, anything to leave us with before we have to let you go to your uh, board meeting? Well, I would say it's never too late to start doing the right thing. Um, obviously, when the market sells off thirty percent, there's a, there's this heightened interest in anything that you know didn't go down, and then people they get excited and then they back off and say, well, every time I do that, you know, I get bad results or I had bad results with managed futures and whatnot. Um, I think the winners in this game, at least in advisory, financial advisory are asset allocators for the most part. There are a few people I know. I talked to some yesterday that are actually really talented at tactical decisions and whatnot, but the vast majority would be much better off with set it and forget it type portfolios. And for that purpose, I just, it's never too late to start doing the right thing. Uh, I'm not saying we're a solution for them, but um, don't lose sight of that and don't make emotional decisions, uh, especially right now. Well, that's also the beauty of where we are in the markets late May. You had this massive downdraft in so many markets, but then you've had this bounce. And so it kind of affords everyone the opportunity at this point. If you're bearish, you know, you've had the, the up move. Here's your chance to get more bearish. You know, if you're bullish, fine. You've had this bounce. You can re you can reassess the portfolio. But in particular, the big lesson to me uh, when talking to people is, if Q1 was super painful, you couldn't sleep at night. It was driving you crazy. You know, now's your chance to adjust that. And then there was something wrong. You can turn the dials to get uh, to get a little bit more balance. But if it didn't bother you at all, God bless you. You probably have a uh, allocation that's that's probably okay. And even if you have 100% stocks, if it doesn't bother you, hey, that's that's good for you too. Eric, I got to let you go. Sadly, we could have do this for two more hours. Uh, I would like to do it again. People want to find out more about Standpoint, uh, what you're doing, your fund, where do they go? Yeah, standpointfunds.com. That's easy. Eric's yeah. been a blast. Thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks, Matt. We'll talk soon. Yeah, man. Matt Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com.